All right, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You may notice in your bulletin the title of today's sermon is, Who Are We? Now, that is an excellent question. It's also extremely general, and so it's very easy to you know, answer that question in a dozen sort of ways. We can say, well, we are the bride of Christ, or we are you know, adopted children, or we are Jesus' brothers, or we are victors, or you know, all kinds of different stuff. But what I mean by that question is not who are we as Christians, but rather who are we as Christian Fellowship Church? Who are we as a group? I know we got some visitors here today, so you're you know, welcome to, to I- enjoy an explanation of some of our core values as a body of believers. How do we identify ourself? Uh, I was talking to an individual the other day, and, and uh, you know, they had the whole C2, C1, C2, C3 conversation. I had to explain it. That's, we don't call Christ Community Church C3. That's not what they're called. <laughs> they're called Christ Community, or you could say CCC if you want. But, uh, you know, they, I asked them, I said, how do, you, how do you identify Christian Fellowship Church? Because even the post office can't get it right. Sometimes we still get each other's mail, and I got a bill the other day from someone. And so, you know, how do you identify? And this person said, well, I just tell them it's Mike and Kara's church. I said, well, let's stop doing that right now. <laughs> Because it is not Micah and Kara's church. I don't want that responsibility, and I don't have that responsibility. This church belongs to Jesus Christ and Him alone. So how do we identify ourselves? Well, we're not the newest church in town anymore, but we're not the oldest. We're not the youngest congregation, but we're not the oldest. We're not the biggest church. We're not the smallest church. We're not the most aggressive church. We're not the most passive church. We're not the most contemporary church, but we're not the most traditional. We don't have the youngest pastor anymore. Yeah, but we also don't have the oldest pastor. Certainly not, although every time an older pastor leaves, a younger one comes in. So I don't know, eventually you're going to have like 15-year-olds pastoring the churches in this town. Praise Praise the Lord. That's right, out of the mouth of babes. When people ask you, where do you go to church, how do you identify this body of Christ? Well, I want to answer that question over the next several weeks in this series entitled, Who Are We at CFC? Who are we? You know, it would be one thing to say, well, we believe, but that doesn't really identify who we are because there's other people that believe the same stuff. We could say, well, these people attend That's not really a good identity because that just tells you who's there. We need to identify ourselves as a group. Who are we as an entire body of Christ? It's a good question, a difficult question. And I think one best answered with this this statement. What spirit resides at CFC? Now, I don't mean what spirit is in like spirit of God, spirit of a man, evil spirits, not that kind of spirit. I mean what kind of atmosphere attitude. When someone visits, what sense do they have? What feelings do they have? What impressions do they have? And what do they walk away with when they're done? That's our identity. A better question might be, what do we want those people to walk away with? What do we want ourselves to experience while we're here? Now, I'm not an existentialist. I don't believe that experience is the key to all life. Don't believe that. But I do believe that experience is important because it can tell us a lot about what's going on. God created experience inside of us for a reason. I want to show you something neat uh, that I I heard at the men's conference. Uh, The the, um, dean, I guess, or whatever, the, the, the guy who's in charge of the school, president, there we go. The president of CBC, Karis Bible College, was telling a story about when Andrew Womack first wanted to start the school. And he was kind of relating his vision for this school to this guy. And he said, you know, this is Andrew saying, he said, I, I've known seminaries whose graduates know the Bible backwards and forwards. They know their theology in season and out of season. They know Hebrew. They know Greek. They know they can quote you verses on any subject, but they are some of the meanest people you'll ever meet. And he said, I know seminaries whose graduates are loving and generous and kind and merciful and compassionate and couldn't quote you one verse from the Bible. He said, I want my school, I want the graduates of my school to love people and to know the word. And I, when he said that, it jumped up inside of me. It was like, that's our mission statement. Our mission statement, if you don't know, 
is to share the love and word of God with our neighbors. That's the mission statement of Christian Fellowship Church, to share the love and the word of God with our neighbors. Interestingly enough, that's CBC's main goal too, to get God's love and word inside the students so they could take it out to the community. That's what our goal is. Now, I love the word of God. I, 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 could sit, I could stand up here with no notes and preach on the word of God for a good hour and a half without taking a breath. Because I love the Word of God. I, I get excited about studying the Word of God. It's my favorite part. Okay, preaching is my favorite part. But then after that, studying the Word of God is my second favorite part about being a pastor. Because I get to do that all day. It's awesome. But I'm going to have to wait because love comes first. And I'll show you why here in a minute. So and I'm not saying anything against the Word of God. I love the Word of God. But we're going to set it aside for next week and a couple weeks after that. For right now, I just want to talk about the love of God, and what I mean when I say sharing the love of God with our neighbors. In other words, I want to share with you my vision for this body of Christ. I want you to know what God has shown me that we are to be. And I've done this in pieces over the last year, but I want you to see it in more detail and laid out nice and flat so that we can see who are we at Christian Fellowship Church. Or better yet, who are we supposed to be? Because we're not what we're supposed to be. We never are. We're always working towards the goal, okay? Who are we or who are we supposed to be? If you've got your Bibles at 1 Corinthians 13, stay there. I'm going to read a couple other verses to you too, and then we'll get into 1 Corinthians 13. First of all, I want to talk to you about how important love is. I'm going to go real fast because I do this all the time. You guys know it, probably can quote the verses to me. But love is most important. Let me show you what I mean. 1 John 4, verse 8. But anyone who does not love or does not love does not know God, for God is love. You say, well, I know the Bible. Great. But do you know love? Because if you don't know love, you don't know God. You can know the Bible and not know God. The Pharisees knew the Bible better than I do, and they didn't know God. The devil knew the Bible. He quoted it to Jesus, and he doesn't know love, and he doesn't know God. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, go to verse 13. He says, and these three things will endure faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is faith. Wait, yours doesn't read that way? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Now you'd think because we are saved by grace through faith, uh, faith moves mountains. There's, it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith should be the most important, but notice what he says. No, the greatest of these is love. We got more. Mark chapter 12, verse 33, one of, the, one of the teachers of the law is talking to Jesus. He's kind of recapping what Jesus said. He said, and I know it is important to love him, God, with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by the law. Love trumps the law. It trumps it. It supersedes it. Let me show you why. Romans chapter 13, verse 8, Paul says, pay all your debts. Accept the debt to love others, because you can never finish paying that. If you love your, love your neighbor, you will fulfill all the requirements of God's laws. Why does love trump the law? Because it fulfills the law. You want to fulfill the law? Love. If you love, you'll fulfill the law. If you don't love, you won't fulfill the law, whether you think you're fulfilling the law or not. Pharisees thought they were fulfilling the law, but they were missing the point because they weren't loving. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, go to the first part of that chapter, verse 1. Paul just spent chapter 12 talking about the gifts of the Spirit. You know, uh, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, tongues, prophecies, miracles, faith. Then there's more than that. Interpretation of tongues. Is that it? Just this? No. Yeah, there's, that's only seven. I'm missing two. What are they? Okay, you guys no help. All right. Uh, <laughs> then in verse 1 of chapter 13, or the, excuse me, the very end of chapter 12, he says... Let me show you a more excellent way. And then verse 1 of chapter 13. If, you, if I could speak in any language, in heaven and on earth, but don't love others, I would only be making a meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I knew all the mysteries of the future and knew everything about everything but didn't love others, what good would I be? And if I had the gift of faith so I could speak to a mountain and make it move without love, I would be no good 
to anybody. Love doesn't just trump the law. It doesn't just uh, fulfill the law. It doesn't uh, just trump faith and, and hope. It also trumps the gifts. You know, there's a lot of people in charismania that are always seeking the gifts. Man, they, they want a word from God, and they'll go to conferences and sit there and get all excited about the word from God, and everyone's, everyone's all in the spirit, and everyone's, oh, God, you know, I just want to see a miracle, and I, I, want to see, I want to see you move in a mighty way. But they don't love anybody but themselves. Paul says, what good is that? You're no good to anybody. What should we be seeking first and foremost? Love. You know what Jesus said? He said, seek ye first the kingdom of who? Notice it doesn't say self. It doesn't say others. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does that mean? Love. Love God. Because remember, love is seeking the desire of someone else over your own desires. That's what love is, selflessness. If we miss out on love, we miss out on the very purpose of our creation because we were created to love God, to have relationship with Him. And if we miss that and spend our lives seeking after money or power or religion or self-righteousness, we will miss the point. And we may be one of those at the end that says, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all this stuff? And He says, hey, I don't even know who you are because you didn't love. Now, of course, we wouldn't know any of this without the Word. <laughs> but we're going to put that up one thing at a time and deal with the word later. You know, as I was preparing this, I had to cut stuff out all the time because I was constantly going back to the word because I get so excited about the Bible that, <laughs> you know, and God was like, no, love. So I have to take it out. Now, love has to begin with loving God. It has to begin with loving God. You say, well, I love people, but you can't love people without first loving God. Love is desiring another's benefit over your own, the selflessness. That's what love is. So when we say we love God, it means caring more about what God wants than what we want. Okay, now this is personal. That means that when God wants you to do something you don't want to do, love does what God wants you to do. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you will obey my commandments. He repeats it twice in the book of John. Okay, if you love me, you'll do what I say. Because love cares more about what the other person wants than what we want. But love, loving God, isn't just a personal thing. Did you know that you can love God as a congregation? What does that look like? Loving God as a congregation. I mean, it would start with us all loving God, but there are, there are uh, churches, and I've seen these, where the majority of the people want what God wants, but when they get together as a congregation, they all talk about what they want. They make decisions based on what they want. They make choices and do things because of what they want. Now, they love God personally, but as a congregation, they don't choose God over themselves. And I don't think it's necessarily something evil. I think that people just never been trained to do that. Especially you go back 50 years, churches were, I mean, they made their decisions with, you know, we, well, we've got our board of directors and we're going to make our decisions and we're going to look at the financial sheet and we're going to look at this because, I mean, uh, we live in America where decisions, I mean, we've, we're the most financially successful country in the history of the world. Why shouldn't we run church like we run business? Because it makes sense, right? But that's not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to love God as a congregation and choose his path instead of our own. Now, of course, I say that you have to love God first before you can love other people, but it's almost cyclical because you can't love God without loving other people. Let me show you what I mean. In, uh, oh, wait, none of the references are here? Oh, here we go. Sorry, I didn't highlight it. I usually highlight all my references. I couldn't find it. In Matthew chapter 25, I'm not going to read it yet, but in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is t talking to the people, and he says, you know, there's going to be people that say, you know, Hey, God, let me into heaven. He says, hey, when I was sick, you didn't do anything for me. When I was, you know, in prison, you didn't visit me and all this kind of stuff. I say, when did we see you? And he said, when you didn't do to the least of these, you didn't do to me. And the reverse was true. Loving God manifests itself in loving other people. So when we have our worship time and it's meditation time and I say, just send God love, I don't mean, you know, go find someone to serve because there is an emotional aspect to it. But if that's all you got for love, if your love is nothing more than an emotional experience with God and it never manifests itself in loving other people, you are deceived. Because you can't love God without loving other people. Let me show you something God showed me as I was prepping for this. I'm just going to quote it to you here. 
He said, a church that doesn't love God won't love anything but themselves. Now that just makes perfect sense because if you've got a congregation that doesn't love God, who else is there to love? They can't love other people because they don't love God. They're only going to love themselves, so they're going to make decisions based on what they want. That's what a church looks like that doesn't love God. They're always about themselves. Uh, I love Jesse Duplantis tells a great story in one of his videos. He drives up to a church and he's supposed to be doing a special service there. Maybe it was like the next night or something like that. He says, there's a woman halfway out the door with a pew. Can you imagine an older woman trying to drag a pew? I, I, got, the, I got the benefit of moving some of these pews around before we got chairs. Those things are heavy. And he said, this old woman's got this pew and she's dragging it out. She said, I paid for this pew. I'm going to take it with me. What is that? That's the love of self in a really funny picture. <laughs> if we don't love God, there's only one thing left to love, self. You know, there are people in this world that don't love God and think they love other people. You know, they work for companies like the Peace Corps, companies like PETA, who think that, oh, I love other people. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to go serve other people, and I'm going to go take care of everybody because I love people. But God, no, I don't like God. He's mean. You know what happens to those people when their life starts to take a turn for the worst? They stop loving other people. What happens to people who love God when their life take a turn, takes a turn for the worst? They start loving other people more. I got a wonderful, a chance to have a wonderful conversation with a woman at the forensics tournament I judged yesterday. She uh, works for, um, oh, garbage. <laughs> they do drug and alcohol counseling. There's a house right next to mine. Valley Hope, thank you. Uh, she works for Valley Hope, not in, in Hoxie. Uh, I don't remember where she's from. And she said, uh, she found out I was a pastor, so we started talking about stuff. And she said, you know, some of the most merciful, compassionate people in the world are, are recovering alcoholics and drug addicts. So you know why? Because they know what it's like to be at the bottom. When Christians get to the bottom, they're like, man, this is what you've been suffering this entire, oh, come here, give me a hug. You know, what happened when Katrina came in and wiped out all that area in the south? Everyone rushed down to help for about three weeks to a month. And then the only ones left were the churches. And the, and the Christian organizations, I guess they were there too. Why? Because we don't love ourselves the way we love God. And when we love God, we love other people. You know, it's no accident that our name is Christian Fellowship Church. You know what fellowship means? Well, that's having a dinner on a Sunday afternoon, right? I told some people the other day I went to a funeral dinner and I said, I'm going to invent a candle called Fellowship Dinner. Can you imagine how that'll sell? Oh, that would smell so good. You ever walked into a fellowship dinner? Like, oh, it smells good. But that, that's not what fellowship means. Fellowship is encouraging one another, building one another up, edifying one another, strengthening one another, spending time with each other for your mutual, mutual benefit. That's fellowship. So when we have a fellowship dinner, we eat dinner, we talk, we have fun. But the purpose of it is not to have fun or to eat. The purpose of it is to build one another up. Why do you think when I pray for the meals, I always pray that our conversation would be edifying? Because that's why we're there. And we are Christian Fellowship Church. We are a church that is supposed to be loving one another into edification and mutual benefit. Can I get an amen on that? I think that needs an amen. So what would a church like this look like? A church that truly loves God as a congregation and loves other people. What does it look like? You still got, anyone got 1 Corinthians 13? Anyone still looking for that? <laughs> okay, let's take a look at it now. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Make you guys look it up and then sit in your lap for 20 minutes. Go to verse 4. 13 verse 4. This is Paul's description of love. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable and it keeps no record when it has been wronged. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, endures through every circumstance. A church that lives love looks like this. You say, well, what does that look like? Well, let me show you some stuff. A church that lives in love has no place for frustration. You say, what? Frustration? What are you talking about? Look at the first part. Love is what? Patient. You know what frustration is? It's a lack of patience. Love is patient. If we as a congregation are patient, then frustration should not ever be here. Amen? 
Okay. Also notice it says that love... Oh, I lost my place here. Okay. Love is... Uh, where, did I, where did I go? Love is patient and it is kind. It is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. That means that a church that lives in love is not going to have any problem with gossip and backbiting. Why? Because it's not jealous. It's not rude. It is not boastful or proud. There's nothing to gossip about when you're walking in love. Because you've got nothing frustrating you, so you've got nothing to talk about that. You've got nothing bad to say about anybody because you're walking in kindness and without jealousy and boastfulness or rudeness. Look at this next one. I love this. Verse 5. Love does not demand its own way. Ouch! Anybody get a little, little prick in the back feel like you got to pull a knife out when you hear that? Love does not insist on its own way. A church that is filled with the love of God and loving other people is not going to have any uh, infighting. It's a church that's not going to have any arguing. Because if you're not demanding on your own way, the only argument you should have is, no, you go first, no, you go first, no, you go first. A Kansas four-way stop, right? Proof that the Kansas state legislator has a sense of humor. <laughs> A church that walks in the love of God is not going to have an argument because an argument is nothing more than trying to win your side of what you want. Well, if you don't want what you want, you want other people to have what they want, there's no point in arguing. I don't like that one either. If you guys don't like that one, I don't like that one either. But I was taught as a little kid, don't mark things out on your Bible. <laughs> You can mark in your Bible, but you can't mark anything out. I got caught doing that when I was a kid. Dad was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm marking stuff out of the Bible. Then he took me to Revelation. You get, who knows what I'm talking about, what I'm referring to? That's right, yeah, some of you get it. Some of you don't. If you don't, look up the end of the book of Revelation, you'll get it. I'll make you do your own homework on that. What's the next one here? Uh, love is, does not insist on its own way. Love is not irritable, and it keeps no record of wrongs. That means that if a church... A body of believers that walks in the love of God is not going to be a place of offense. What is offense? Offense is the refusal to forgive someone until they pay you back. Which, of course, isn't actually forgiveness. That's something else. We'll, we'll deal with that some other time. A church that walks in love is a church in, with, that is, has no offense because we don't keep a record of wrongs. What's the next one? We've got to keep moving here. Verse 6. It is never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. A church that loves God and loves other people is a place where there's no dishonesty. Because they're always rejoicing in the truth. What's the next one here? Verse 7. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. A church that's filled with God's love and loves God is a church where people don't quit. Now, does that mean that no one should ever leave this church and go someplace else. No, I always say you go where God wants you to go. But you don't quit because you gave up. Never quit because you give up. In fact, actually, that, that's, that doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Because it means exactly the same thing. Don't give up because you give up. No, you guys, anybody know what I'm talking about? You go, okay, good, I'll move on. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to have to come up with another way to explain that. A church that loves God looks like that. It's, it's the place where there's no frustration. No backbiting, no gossip, no arguing, no offense, no dishonesty, no quitting. Because we have love. You say, well, I, I love the people in this church, Pastor. I love them because they're great people. No, no. You're supposed to love your friends and your enemies. You're supposed to love the people that bless you and curse you. So you don't get to say, I love CFC because the people are great. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm glad you like them, but you should love them because they're people. <laughs> Because they're humans and they, God says to love them. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay, let's move on to Matthew chapter 25. Turn over there, please. Let's finish here. Matthew chapter 25. I'm going to read it to you starting in, verse, starting in verse 35 and then we'll talk about this. Because I say loving God and loving others combined because they really are... You can't have one without the other. You can't really love humanity without loving God, and you can't love God without loving humanity. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 30, uh, yeah, verse 35, Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I, he's talking to the righteous. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. 
I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will tell them, I assure you, when you did it to the least one of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. One of the most awkward things I do as a Hama minister is benevolence. I don't know why. I haven't figured it out yet. But one of the ways that God got me over that is by saying, look, you're helping the needy. You're giving money to people who don't have it. You're giving food to people who don't have it. That means you're doing it to me. Like, oh. And then it became easy. <laughs> and then it was just, hey, someone would call up, hey, I need some money. Hey, come on down. We'll give you some food. I always end up giving them more food than I'm supposed to. I just, I don't know. I got in trouble for it once. <laughs> I still do it. <laughs> oh, this is on video. Oh, no. Anyway. Hey, I'm the president. I do what I want. <laughs> uh, oh, right. Sorry. That's right. Doesn't insist on its own way. <laughs> Anyone hear the Holy Spirit in here? I heard something. <laughs> That's right. He said, don't do what you want. Right. Okay. Verse 41. Go here. I want to show you something else. Then the king will turn to those on his left. These are the wicked. And he will say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you gave me no clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I assure you, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. Anybody ever pick Jesus up on the side of the road? Anybody ever gave Jesus a, a gift because you knew he needed it? Say, well, Pastor Jesus doesn't need anything. No, but his people do. His children do. Even people that don't know him do. And when you do for them, when you love them, that's loving God. Now, we need to have a personal, emotional relationship with Jesus. But if it stops there, we're missing the point. Because you can't say, I love God and not love people. However you treat other people is how you treat God. If you bless people, you're blessing God. But if you curse people, you're cursing God. If you forgive people, you're, you're, well, you can't forgive God, but you know what I'm saying. When you forgive people, you're living openly with God, but when you hold offense against people, you're holding it against God. When you treat other people nicely, you're treating God nicely, but when you treat them rudely, you're treating God rudely. When you overlook a person because they're not like you or because you, you don't care for them or they're weird or poor or whatever it is, you're overlooking God himself, but when you include them, you're including God. When you lift up someone, you lift up God, but when you marginalize them, you marginalize God. You know, if we lived our lives with that understanding, I, I have a feeling the world would be a different place. Because when we see a face in front of us, we see the face. We see the person. But that's not who we're serving. You know, you see me up here delivering what God had would have me tell you. Ignore this. It's not pretty anyway. There's no point in paying attention to it. Pay attention to the spirit behind it. Because when you listen to me, you're listening to God. Unless, of course, I say something wrong. Then, no, we well, don't go there. <laughs> when you forgive your spouse for being obnoxious again, you're doing it to God. And you sure will not <laughs> We have to look at the Father through the people in our lives. And when we do that, we will see the love of God manifest itself through us. And you know what that does? It produces a holy lifestyle. In fact, it is a holy lifestyle. When I was in the Wesleyan church, I studied under a denomination that believes in what's, what they call entire sanctification, living a perfect life. I don't believe you can live a perfect life on earth, but this group did. And so I was studying, trying to figure it out. And one day I wrote a paper to my, um, uh, to my, uh, the, the board of ministerial development. And I said, you know what, guys, you're missing it. 
Uh, I can't believe they let me stay a student. Uh, I said, you guys are missing it because you keep talking about living a holy lifestyle, meaning no smoking, no drinking, no gambling, no dancing. They were a, a, a holiness church, so a lot of those things. You can't do those things. I said, no, it's not what you can't do. It's what you need to do. If you live a life of perfect love, you're living a life of perfection. And we need to live that life of perfection out towards other people. I want to wrap this up. Who are we as the Christian Fellowship Church in Hoxie, Kansas? I would say, first of all, as most important, we need to be a church of love. We need to be a church that takes 1 Corinthians 13 extremely seriously. We need to be a church that understands that serving other people's interests is serving God's interests. We need to understand that living a life of frustration or backbiting or gossip or arguing or offense or dishonesty is not a life of love. Because when we get that, we will start living a life of holiness. And I got good news. A life of holiness produces some pretty good stuff. When you live a life of holiness with God, it prospers you. Now, does that mean that you earn prosperity? No. It's just a natural result. Now, of course, I do mean in the physical, but not staying there. A person who lives a holy life before God prospers in his spirit. He has the gifts of the spirit working in him more often. He has a closer relationship with God. This person who lives a holy life has a soul that prospers. That means his emotions are good and strong and in check. This person has a mind that prospers where he receives revelation from the Father and has wisdom and understands. A person who has prosperity in his body where manifestations of healing and strength come in. And of course in his pocketbook as well. Prosperity in every way. Now, I don't know what your dream for Christian Fellowship Church is. But I would like every person in this community to look out this direction and say, man, what have they got? They got something. Everyone who attends that church is happy. Everyone who attends that church is blessed. God answers the prayers of the people that attend that church. Why? Why are they so nice to everyone? I want everybody in this community to be jealous of the people who attend this church. Why? Because that will motivate them to ask what we have. And when we tell them, <laughs> here's Jesus. It's better than dope. It's better than alcohol. Trust me, you take this, there are no side effects. Well, beheading is possible in some countries. But, you know, here in America, there's no side effects. <laughs> Sorry, that just came to me for accepting Jesus. This is my vision for the Christian Fellowship Church. Now, it doesn't end there. My vision for Christian Fellowship Church includes knowing the word like no other body of believers in town. But I want this church first to be known as a church of love. And when people come in, I remember talking to Cheryl years and years ago when I first started coming here. And I sat down with her and I said, you know, I asked her a story. She said, oh, yeah, we, we came later. We started coming later. I said, why did you start coming? And she said, we just walked in and it was, you could just feel the love. That was when I knew, oh, this is a place I want to pastor. That's what I want people, when they come in, I want them to feel the love. Because that means they're feeling God because God is love. Amen? Amen. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you that you are love. And that the strength of your love is greater than the strength of even your justice. That your love motivated you to give up your own son to die on the cross for us, that we could have life with you. Father, we do have the eternal debt of love. I know we can't pay it all back to you, but help us to pay it to one another by living 1 Corinthians 13, by loving other people the way that you loved us. And Father, I pray for this congregation of believers that we would stand firm in your love, knowing that we are loved and then in turn love other people because... We love because you first loved us. And Father, I pray that the vision you have given me for this body would come true, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, and that this place would be a place of love overabounding. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said... Amen.